Welcome to this last session, unbelievably, of the Battle of Ideas. I can't believe it's gone quite so fast, but we do hope to go out with a bang. This session's on, have we given up on sexual freedom? My name is Tiffany Jenkins, and I'll be chairing. We'll do the same format, but we have a really good panel for you. Speaking first, uh, on my immediate right, is Nina Power, who is a philosopher and senior editor at Compact Magazine and author of What Do Men Want?, masculinity and its discontents. Speaking next will be Ralph Leonard, who is sitting on her immediate right. He's the author of Unshackling Intimacy, uh, which is a Letters on Liberty pamphlet. And if you are interested in this subject and you haven't read it, I commend it to you. It's from the uh, Academy of Ideas, and it's a really fascinating exploration of sexuality and sexual freedom. Um, Speaking after Ralph will be Rosie Wilby, who's on my immediate left. She's an award-winning comedian, author of Is Monogamy Dead? and The Breakup Monologues, The Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak. It is actually very funny, and she's got a couple of books with her to persuade you. If you <laughs> Then we'll hear from Ella Whelan. Ella is probably familiar uh, to you by now. She's the co-convener, heroically, of the Battle of Ideas Festival, a journalist and author of What Women Want. We'll hear from them, but I'd just like to say this is a panel I've been really uh, wanting to have and hear for uh, about for some time. You know, I never thought 10, 15 years ago that this would even be a question, like what's ever happened to the sexual revolution? Was it even a good thing? These were not questions I thought would be posed ever. And it's certainly been the case that in the last few years you've seen a real cooling upon it and even tracks now against it. Um, so I'm interested to know what our panel think, and then you. Nina. Right, okay, I, I'm going first, it seems. Um, <laughs> here we are. Um, so the question, have we given up on sexual freedom? My uh, initial response to this is, um, is hopefully, um, somewhat controversially. <laughs> um, well, I, I jest, but I'll, I'll explain a bit. Well, I might say that. I, I think, you know, just personally speaking, one of the best things about getting older is the sort of um, the diminution of desire and its replacement with looking at the birds and reading books and stuff. I think, you know, this kind of, you know, there's something very beautiful about that. And I speak to lots of men who say that they're no longer shackled to their penis and how wonderful it is. Um, so, you know, something to look forward to for younger people. Um, the world... <laughs> The world opens up, <laughs> not in a sexy way. Um, so I, but I think there is a there is a serious point here about kind of sublimation and even repression. Um, you know, nothing really gets done unless we do something with our instincts, and and you know we are capable of, um, you know, doing something about it. We we have a culture that actually in many ways encourages us not to um, sublimate, but rather um, stimulates our desire, uh, often leading to kind of big problems in terms of overconsumption of, of food and, and, and other addictive things, you know, we're kind of designed in some ways to be very compulsive, um, you know, habit-forming beings. And it's actually quite difficult to, to cope with that for all of us, you know, on an individual level. Sometimes we eat too much, sometimes we drink too much, you know, get more, you know, watch too much porn, you know, these, these are real problems, you know. And I, and I don't say that in a judgmental way, it's just saying that this is something we all... Um, are prey to and we all have to kind of come to terms with our own desire negotiate it come to some arrangement with ourselves maybe with someone else who is into something that we want to do or they want to do um, you know this is a weird thing sex becomes this kind of um, a concept that has structured our society and our culture since you know so-called sexual revolution what the sexual revolution is really about is a kind of detachment of sex and its consequences. You know, if we think about reproductive technologies um, and the kind of promise of, of let's say, the consequence-free fuck <laughs> um, for women especially, what does it mean to take the contraceptive pill, to, to have this kind of power and control over that, that, you know, we could talk about the positive aspects about that, but we could also say, look, it's a massive shift in how we understand what sex is. Sex no longer is um, a part of, let's say, 
uh, a teleological process, which is to say something that has an end goal, right? So whether we're talking about marriage and children and a more traditional model, it's rather its own separate thing. And thus it becomes attached to ideas of individuality, of self-expression, of being a certain kind of person who is exploring their own identity and so on. And we really see the kind of culmination of this um, sort of, uh, I don't know, tying together of sexual desire and identity in a sort of crisis, apotheosis of identitarianism in which people's identity is sort of who they are. And it's actually kind of weird to think about that. It's nothing to do with your character or your social role or your where you come from or your family, but rather it's some other sort of thing that you've decided you are, like I'm an asexual furry or something. <laughs> and, you know, that's very odd. There, there's something kind of historically unique and specific about that kind of fusion of identitarianism with a sort of consumerism and an individuality. Um, and we could say, right, great, this is wonderful. We've reached this sort of apex of, of you know, self... Um, I don't know, self-definition or something like that, and sex is part of this process. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think we have to uh, acknowledge that it's come at um, quite a lot, quite some cost, you know, and that this model of freedom is also a freedom that detaches people from each other, that pursues a kind of uh, often very selfish sort of, um, you know, idea of what it means to be a human being that is detached from others, even if you might use others um, sexually or whatever. And I think, you know, um, Tiffany mentioned a kind of maybe pushback against a sort of sexually liberated uh, identification of sex with freedom. And you have to say, well, freedom for who? You know, who did the sexual revolution benefit? Well, if it is about the detachment of sex from its consequences, and who benefits from that? Well, it's the CAD. <laughs> you know, and you could be a female CAD and a male CAD, but we would identify the CAD as someone who really, uh, if you like, doesn't take responsibility. You know, who's someone who kind of gets what he can, and he can also be she, um, but rather than just plays the field, if you like. Uh, and this, I think, is actually not what most people ultimately want. Most people would like to be in a serious, meaningful, intimate relationship with somebody where sex has um, a warm character and that is affectionate. It may be tied to having children, um, but it's not this kind of quantitative, um, high-definition, pornographic, act-based sort of um, performance, which I think is one of the reasons why a lot of young people in particular are pulling away from sex entirely um, and either identifying out of it or not engaging in it because we've, we've gone into a virtual world. But not only that, that sex itself is being presented as this absolutely terrifying sort of, you know, quantitative performance um, and is completely sort of severed from these things that we might actually want, warmth and intimacy and, and kindness and affection and so on, which I think is ultimately still what most people desire. So desire itself has become, you know, messed up. And, you know, we need to sort of reclaim it, I think, in a Beckettian mode. Like Samuel Beckett writes about sex in a very silly way. And, and he points out how sort of ridiculous it is. Uh, and I think we need to reclaim the sense of the absurd and the ridiculous um, and also just not be that interested in sex. So I think we should give up on sexual freedom, um, but in the name of <laughs> a sort of different kind of freedom, which is more gentle and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> I realised when I accepted to be on this panel that I am the only man on this panel. <laughs> Young, still... <laughs> Still a young man who might or might not be changed to his penis. Uh, you know, since my God-given male member decided to give me no peace, I decide to give it no rest in return. <laughs> uh, okay, but in all seriousness, um, because of uh, this decades-long process of sexual liberalization we've experienced, we do risk falling into a sense of complacency or misconception of the sexual question in an era which seems more tolerant, even celebratory, of sexual variety and fluid fluidity, when in theory anyone, 
and I put in theory in quotes, can procure a booty call at the swipe of an app. And mm. pop culture abounds with very explicit representations of the sexual experience. But at the same time, sexuality seems to be hollowed out into a pathetic simulacrum of itself. A disfigured, anemic libido, devoid of any spice and color, clashes against fluctuating notions of decency in mass pornography, mostly depicting very rehearsed, sterilized, robotic, mechanical penetration with intricate notions of what ought to be prescribed. You know, peri periodic moral panics over the supposed over-sexualization of today's youth cloaks the extent to which they endure impotent frustration. The so-called sex recession among younger people reveals an epidemic of celibacy among men and women, but especially men, while the issue of incels has managed to acquire political value in the last few years. Moreover, sexu sexuality and procreation are politicized, especially in the United States through the culture wars. Take the, take the issue of abortion. The current quarrel over abortion reveals an, you know, a split between within the bourgeois liberal aspiration that recreational and procreational sex be split and that procreation be a personal choice where the Democrats affirm the right not to procreate while Republicans affirm the right to procreate. As well, age gap relationships are also increasingly demonized and stigmatized where there are clear, where the clear moral difference between a 30-year-old man going after a 13-year-old girl and a 42-year-old man going out with a 26-year-old woman is uh, blurred. An illusion that, on the one hand, infantilizes women and negates their own sense of sexual agency, while also demonizing and pathologizing the natural and healthy male attraction towards post-pubescent young, younger women. You also hear mantras over sex scenes in films and how unnecessary they are to the plot. Well, but this critique underestimates how sexuality is fundamental to us as a species and to the human condition overall. Sexuality in art can evoke a mood, place you in the mindset of a character, and at times critical to the character arcs within a story. It can even enhance the aesthetic of a film. Hell, it can even be good for its own sake, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, the problem with sexual freedom now has less to do with sex itself, but the general state of society. As Theodore Adorno once put it, in an unfree society, sexual freedom is hardly more conceivable than any other form of freedom. That we are still not sexually free is but as a symptom that we, are still, we still do not live in a free society. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> Rosie. Thank you. Well, hello. So my first book, Is Monogamy Dead, was inspired in 2017 when I heard that in many surveys around 50% of people confessed to cheating. And that got me thinking, if you are in a monogamous relationship, you better look closely at your partner. Simple math says it has got to be them. Uh, <laughs> but it also... Uh, got me thinking, why are we so scared of cheating and, by extension, sexual freedom? And I conducted my own survey to find out what even counts as cheating. And 8% of people who answered thought that their partner even thinking about somebody else would count as cheating. And I don't know, you raised your eyebrows. I don't know how we would even police that. What are you, what are you thinking about? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, that's a bit of a scary one. So I believe that our sexual freedoms have long been compromised by the restrictive structures we place around sex, monogamy, marriage, the nuclear family. It's in effect strangely amplified in recent times by appointing the internet a big brother style matchmaker that selects our lovers for us. The illusion of choice makes it impossible to feel happy with any choice at all, and yet, largely speaking, we're still supposed to choose just one. In the early days of online dating, I was emailed a list of my ideal matches and weirdly included my own profile, but I was still only a 73% match. <laughs> 
The last time I had casual no-string sex, it was the 1990s. I'd responded to a personal ad in a newspaper. Not that you could really have no-string sex as a lesbian in 1990s London, because everybody knew each other and caught the same bus. Uh, <laughs> 73 to Stoke Newington. <laughs> Uh, because all lesbians live there because there's no tube and they're afraid of penetration of the earth. Uh, and it's 1990s queer London that I wanted to time travel back to because in a capitalist online age where every thought has been commodified, the wildness of sex can surely only survive in countercultural spaces. When I get asked to join these debates, have we given up on sexual freedom? Have we forgotten how to have orgasms? Have we choked to death on middle-class guilt and oat lattes? Uh, the we usually refers to uh, mainstreamy normal people. How boring, because in viewing sex through a normative lens, we're short-sighted. We miss out on the playfulness and creativity forged by the outsiders who've hung on and clung on to sexual freedom as long as they can. And we miss out on the patterns of behaviour typical of men and women when members of the opposite sex are taken out of the equation. Gay and lesbian couples are the perfect control experiment, a clear indication of male and female strategies for incorporating sexual novelty and enjoying some kind of freedom which as humans we surely need. Is there a better advocate for ethical non-monogamy than the ridiculously low divorce rates of gay men and previously civil partnership dissolution rates. They typically have open and honest arrangements around sex outside of a primary partnership, whereas lesbians of my generation tend to favour rapid serial monogamy, rotating partner every few years. And when same-sex marriage became law in the UK in 2014, I argued on Woman's Hour that lesbians might actually be relinquishing freedoms rather than gaining them. Mm. And back in the 1990s, boundaries were fluid around different types of connection and intimacy. Sex was by far the best way to make a friend. It was a great icebreaker if you were an introvert. And <laughs> it's far easier to initiate than a conversation. Um, Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll talk. Um, <laughs> Logical family, a term used by Armistead Maupin, described our loose collectives of lovers, ex-lovers and friends who stuck by us during the tough times of homophobia. Looser living apart together arrangements allowed us more freedom than the high-pressure high production line of forced matches our young straight peers whizzed through as they boarded what's known as the relationship escalator. Dating, living together, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? And then you reach the top and you die and you've won at love. Congratulations. Why a wedding anniversary celebrated in increasing hierarchies of gifts from paper and wood to gold and rubies and diamonds? Why do we celebrate longevity and staleness over independence and freedom? Yet the flip side of immersing myself in queer culture throughout my sexual prime was that was the era of identity politics, which we've, we've touched on, and one had to stand up and be counted. And in attaching such a sticky label of lesbian to my proudly puffed out chest, I might have denied myself the freedom of sleeping with men, which I only realized I might have been intrigued by when I participated in a sex lab experiment as research, let's say research, uh, for, for my book, where bizarrely the control video you watch in between the clips of erotica is a David Attenborough nature documentary. <laughs> no, they aren't measuring your arousal during that, sadly. Sure, I'm a homo romantic. My longest lasting relationships will most likely always be with women, but sex with men? Maybe. Yet finally, one could argue that humans can never be sexually free, so addicted as we are to the reward chemicals that are pumped around our hungry brains when we have sex. Really, they govern how we have sex and who with. Thank you, Rosie. Ella. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I'm conflicted on the issue of sexual freedom only in that I'm incredibly prudish, actually. And... Uh, and don't really like talking about sex in public. Maybe it's the, you know, former Catholic upbringing. But I think that the important thing in the title, the important word in the title, have we given up on sexual freedom, is the F word, freedom. And I think that we have in the conversation around the ramifications and consequences of the sexual revolution, almost totally given up on the idea that it provided freedom or that the freedom aspect of it, not the sex aspect of it, was the important bit. Um, you know, we all can 
can can understand and identify the sort of excesses in the world of uh, sexual expression at the moment, whether it be rows around gender ideology and sexuality, or whether it be the sort of uh, you know increase in porn for young people, which you know do you think that's a real thing and a and a bit of a problem? Whether it's the sort of sexualization of many aspects of life, you know things like you know programs like Naked Attraction on television where sex and sexual arousal is reduced to this sort of almost, uh, Ralph used the word mechanical, extreme, literally a shutter pulling up from toes to penis to chest. Um, you know, that, that, there's something weird and awful going on there and ooh, I don't, you know, we don't like it. Um, but uh, to me, what's more horrifying than that has been the reaction to it, which is that, you know, the, the desire to retreat and return to some kind of reactionary past where freedom, particularly women's freedom and women's sexual freedom, was a bad thing. Because from the, con con from the contraceptive pill to uh, you know, advances in technology, whether it's around abortion or changes in social attitudes to that kind of aspect of reproductive technologies and women's ability to control the consequences of their sex, li sex life, to me, it is undoubtedly a good thing that we have been, have access to more freedom. It's undoubtedly a good thing that I can pick who I'm going to have sex with, when I'm going to have sex with them, without having my parents or my priest or whoever clip me around the ear about it. And that I can go to a doctor and have the facilities to be able to control the consequences of my sexual exploits. I just, I just cannot see why anyone would have a problem with that. But, but actually, I can see why people have a problem with it. Because the problem at the heart of this is a really deep misanthropy, which is the idea that if human beings, and particularly women, have too much freedom, have too much to go on too many nights out, have too many days, let loose too often, that they are forever damaged, but also that they will always do the disgusting thing. They will always do the bad thing. They will always just, you know, misuse their freedom. We'll always end up like animals. Um, and I just, I have taken a completely different view of human nature. And I take a completely different view of what sex means to human nature and our expression of it. You know, the, the sort of, the anti-sexual freedom movement, particularly among the feminists, sir. And I'm going to say this now, it's the last session I did. I'm going to piss everyone off. Um, it, is, it makes me extremely angry because I think what it does is it refactions all of the old arguments against freedom, which was that women are not rational, they're not reasonable, they're not in control, they have no agency. And what it says is that all these things that give you uh, are the tools that you can use to manage and, and you know, contribute towards your agency, whether it be the pill or anything else, are actually just too dangerous for you to handle. Take them away from the ladies because they'll misuse them um, and they'll end up these damaged sluts, basically, is what the picture ends up being. That women end up becoming these dirty things with A's written on them. And as you can tell, that's as someone with a particularly checkered sexual past. My mum's in the audience. Sorry, mum. But, you know, I completely reject that. I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, you know, a totally wrong way of viewing women's freedom and freedom. And I think, you know, Ralph, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have identified the fact that there is something going on with young people and there's something going on with them not having sex or them not wanting to have sex. It's very different from the sort of, you know, 60s, 70s generation. And some people might tell you that the problem is that there's too much sex out in the, out in the world and that we think about sex too much. And probably there's an element of that which is true. But I don't think that the problem is too much sex with young people, I think is that they're not having enough. I mean, literally, they're not doing it. And this is, you know, I, I would sit here and, and make an argument for how wonderful and brilliant sex is, um, not from some kind of degraded position, from, but actually from quite, I take a quite high fluting view of sex, which is that what you do when you enter into a sexual relationship with someone is that whether it's an hour after you've met or a year after you've met, is that you open yourself up to the possibility of risk and you vulnerabilize yourself. There is nothing more vulnerabilizing physically or emotionally 
than stripping off in the dark or otherwise <laughs> and opening yourself up to somebody. Because what you're doing when you're entering into it, stop sniggering. When you're, when you're entering into a relationship like that, there is the, the biggest and most important thing is that it could all go wrong. It could all go wrong. You could, after a minute or after an hour, you could decide that this was the worst decision you ever made. That you, it, actually, Gen Z have a term for it. They call it the ick. You know, that, that, that you can, you know, this, you could immediately decide after entering into this relationship that you don't want to have any part of it. That you could have really bad sex. That actually you could have, a, get into bed with someone who you thought you knew and get out of bed with them realizing that they were totally the wrong person and you didn't know them at all. And the key word in this is the idea of risk. We are a risk. We are becoming incredibly risk averse, particularly young people. When I was, uh, well, you know, a teenager, particularly at school, I remember our sort of sex education, and actually they used to have adverts on television. The main way in which we talked to young people about sex was the risk of gonorrhea, pregnancy, chlamydia, and obviously in previous generations, AIDS. It was a very, you know, the, the, the conversation about sex and danger was, was sort of technical, practical. It was about these things that could happen to your body um, you know, teenage pregnancy or, um, or, you know, sexual diseases. We don't, I don't actually even know if they talk to kids about that anymore or whether, or whether you know, people even talk about condoms and that. The conversation now is always about psychological risk, consent classes, trauma, the, the idea that if you don't literally, as they suggest in some universities in the States, sign pieces of paper or record your voice into apps saying, we consent to this, you know, before you take your knickers off that there might be the potential that you'll be forever scarred. And I think this is the thing we have to challenge, which is that we have to bring freedom back into sex. We have to bring back bravery back into sex, which is to say it, you, you are going to be okay if you have bad sex. You're going to be okay if you have a lot of bad sex and it's terrible for a very long time because the thing that we perhaps, and this will I and Tiffany, that we also have to start championing is the idea that all sex, whatever shape it may take and however, how often you engage in it, should and can involve some form of vulnerabilizing intimacy and that's where love comes in, even if it's fleeting, even if you don't end up marrying that person. The idea that when you are vulnerabilized and open yourself up to that, the possibility of love and romance can flourish. And I'm a romantic. I, think, I don't think that we stay with each other when, you know, through uh, wedding anniversaries and things like that because we're sort of constraining ourselves and, and we're just fighting our animalistic urges to say it would be right for me to stay with this person, it would be right. I think it's because when you meet that person, you just know. And, that's, and you can't put your finger on it. It's a bit, you know, it's ethereal. It's kind of spiritual. It's magical. I'm fine for it to not be scientific and for me to not be able to put my finger on it. I think that's the kind of that's the essence of what it means to be human is understanding that there might be some parts of us which are always a little bit out of reach. You never really can know if that other person actually really loves you. Isn't that the whole magic of it? That there's this, this constant risk that it might always go wrong, but let's keep trying and hope that it doesn't. So I think we need to bring back freedom. We need to bring back sort of a comfortableness of being vulnerable. And we need to remember that going backwards in terms of social movements is never the answer. It is a funny discussion uh, because um, although the, a lot of sex at the moment is quite public, um, talking about it is quite hard because it's a very private thing. And so I think um, you should just give it a go and see how it goes. Can I see you? Uh, <laughs> let's, let's take, we'll take a collection and it's, but, but, yeah, but let's come over here to these two at the front. The idea that, you know, we live in a time when the idea of intersubjectivity, so human subjects meeting one another, is the most fraught over thing there is. And isn't sexuality the most intersubjective thing, intersubjective thing we can do? And the idea that we have to break open every part of these kind of fraught over intersubjective meetings, you know, not just in sex, to then become just normal human beings with one another again. We, that we are, oh, everybody's a subject who meets on the same level. You know, we must assume this from the get-go in every situation. And then 
the sex will follow. Or maybe it will lead, I don't know. I'm German, I would say the sex will lead. Ella talked about the need to um, put the freedom back into sex. Can we think about the need to put the sex back into freedom? There's a lot of ostensible um, sexual freedom that's got no sex in it at all. It's, it's, it's about images and words and identities and, and things like that. And it, it's quite peculiar. Um, a contrast occurred to me. Before AIDS, before a rainbow flag, um, gay men in certain scenes had the hanky code, multicolored handkerchiefs in your back pocket, which said, I'm into this, you know, and if you're into this, we'll go off and do something. Um, you know, in a sort of marketplace, as it were, of, of people. Um, so it's a very practical thing. It's not a, it's not a form of self-expression, except in as much as it has a, a certain, it leads to a certain result. Contrast that with recently, there was this very strange demonstration in London. Um, it was called something like the pro, a pro-kink demonstration or a kink rights, something like that. It was a demonstration against Facebook for its filters and they inter the Evening Standard interviewed people in this demonstration about why they were so cross about these Facebook filters. And they were all sort of saying, because it, you know, it's shaming me for my kink and it's terrible for my self-esteem. Um, you know, and all these terrible things like this. And it also, it, it arose that they thought this was particularly bad during the lockdown and during pandemic. You know, so it wasn't really to do with people having sex with each other. It was bizarre. It was about something completely different. Um, and I think if we try and unpick that a little bit, it might help us make sense of this area. Thank you. This is a question, a question for Ella. Um, do you think that maybe the, would you say the main issue is the infantilization of young people? Um, I went to uni um, a little while ago now, but I remember actually the first day they sort of ushered us into this room and we had um, um, this um, sort of video on the screen and it was like, you know, the analogy was like drinking a cup of tea and it was like, you know, you wouldn't, um, make someone drink tea if they were asleep, right? And it was supposed to be this, like, talking about sex, and I thought, you know, Christ, like, you, surely, I hope everyone knows that. Um, and, you know, do we need, even even if that was the message, you know, do we need it wrapped up in such an infantilized, you know, presentation? I remember in the toilets, it was like, it's never just a grope. You know, the idea that if you've been out on a night out, and, you know, <laughs> girls often talk about, you know, a guy will put his hand on your waist to sort of, like, move you out of the way. Yeah, you know, these things are slightly annoying, but... Are we sort of like politicizing this risk and... Hi, um, <clears throat> I'd like to maybe put one of Ella's points back to the two first speakers. I'd be interested uh, to what you would say to the idea that uh, now with young people, uh, because we have all of this simulacra, pornography, naked attraction, sex dolls, all of these kind of uh, uh, ghosts of desire and sexuality but then at the same time I liked your point about kind of desires kind of hollowed out is it then not more important than ever to get back into our bodies and to actually get out there and have sex I think the sexual revolution has really been detrimental uh, to women I think we were sold this lie at the time this Carrie, Carrie Bradshaw character that if we were to work like a man and play like a man and, and f like a man then we would be free and happy and fulfilled and all it would take to get there would be the pill and abortion and, and never mind uh, what this impact might have on us and our hormones and our physical and, and mental well-being. And we're still discovering the real impact of this today. Uh, Yale University, which is really quite a woke institution, uh, published recently that year on year since the 70s or decade on decade, women's happiness has declined in both relative and absolute terms in relation to men. So I was wondering if the panel could reflect on some of the findings from Louise Perry and Mary Harrington and Gad Saad and who have looked at the evolutionary biology of women and discovered that we are different to men, that this culture of so-called freedom, it, if it's freedom that is only really defined by promiscuity, is this something that is beneficial to women and our well-being and our mental state or is this something that really is more beneficial to the evolutionary biology of man? And uh, what about this idea about women gatekeeping sex and men gatekeeping commitment and how those two work together and whether this current paradigm is allowing for us both to flourish? Thank you. I'm one of the older men and believe when you get older, you get chained to a prostate and it is much worse. Because, even, because I think even the horniest men piss more than they have sex. But uh, just, I grew up in a very kind of strict society that sex was a taboo. You couldn't talk to women in public. 
pornography was available, it's not that we were just repressed. And there were some of us who had connections, had sex workers, and some of us like me who were scared of STD, they never get close to them. So um, it's, it didn't work in that environment, I have, I'm afraid to say. And one thing that the lady mentioned, problem, promiscuity, I think we have to separate freedom from promiscuity and bring the control in it. And maybe the new generation exists, are exercising the, that control over their sex lives. We don't know. It's an empirical question. Has anybody gone and asked them what has happened? And I'm not aware of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nina, shall be more, so you'll have time. Okay. I, I think the point about bodies um, is a good one. And I think we are in a state of total confusion around things like touch because everything's become over-sexualized and their people are afraid to then be affectionate or flirt or, you know, engage in these kinds of behaviors so that it's sort of either nothing at all and terror or HD pornographic absex or something. And like, there's no sort of, and the whole point about flirtation is it is sort of undecidable and you don't know if someone's actually flirt with you. And, and all of that. So there is this kind of middle ground that's sort of been lost. And I think it's, it is, you know, with the lockdown and everything, there was this kind of all these edicts against touch, like just affectionate, normal touch between people who like each other. And that's bad. People should be like affectionate because touch is really important for human relations and for feeling alive and recognized. And so, you know, t touch, good. Random, brutal sex, not good. Especially for women, I do agree. I'm sort of on the Mary Harrington, Louise Perry side. I think they have a point. Um, at least, let's put it this way, we should be asking questions about the sexual revolution that, that are serious and that, you know, just saying, did it work? What, what was good about it? What was bad? You know, I think that's what's going on. Ralph? Sexuality, like human nature, is ambiguous. Like it's, we know it's there, but it's kind of hard to sort of pin down. Uh, which is why sort of you get these questions about whether humans are naturally monogamous or naturally polyamorous, which is, it's, it's a false dichotomy because like human sexuality can take up many, many different expressions and has many different flavors and there are many, uh, poems in which it can take, it can, there's a wholesome, cute, you know, homey aspect to it, but then there's also a very aggressive carnal, violent aspect to it. Um, so this is why we have to understand that ambiguity about human sexuality to advance this ag argument of further. Rosie. Yeah, I think on the point that women are fundamentally different to men, I think that's very much what I've found, but what I was surprised and, um, you know, what I enjoyed when I did research in the polyamorous community and went and did comedy at a sex party uh, for research again uh, huh, um, was that it was actually a much more feminist space than I expected. So I do think that um, there are spaces, again, perhaps I'm talking about countercultural spaces where women are calling the shots and, and writing the rules. Um, and there are quite a lot of rules when you go into a sex party. And I really thought that they're good sort of takeaways for anyone in a more conventional monogamous relationship, really sort of respecting other people's boundaries, fostering a sense of mutual accountability and, and so on. And really, they'd be quite good rules to really use in any sort of office environment, really. <laughs> so, um, I, and yeah, when I went to a relationship anarchy meeting, it was the most organized meeting I've ever been to, to be honest. Uh, we had to queue until the room was ready and then followed an agenda. But I, I do think there's, there seemed to be a very different set of rules that were much more women positive and not this sort of patriarchal set of rules that we seem to have more, more broadly that do obviously do women no favors. Ella. Um, well, you know, so Ralph sort of said a sexual desire doesn't conform to, you know, your own sexual desire doesn't conform to rules. I mean, if Eric Pickles put his hand on my ass, I would react very differently <laughs> than to if Leonardo DiCaprio did. You know, that, and that's, the, that's an awkward sort of thing to admit, isn't it? Is yeah. that obviously a lot hangs in the balance of whether or not you desire the person. In a more serious and mundane situation, obviously, at, you know, as a heterosexual woman, my, you know, youth, my 20s, I would go, wait at bars hoping that a man would come and, you know, interact with me. 
hoping that it would be the right guy. Otherwise, you'd you know go go to the side. And you you know now that I've been older, I think all well, those poor guys, those poor guys who get the because you know they're not they're not they're not doing anything wrong other than that I don't fancy them. And so I think we have to we have to pick that apart. And it relates to the you know the question about whether men and women are different. Um, because men and women are different biologically, obviously, you know, and well, obviously, it's not obvious to some, but I think, you know, certainly obvious to me, the way in which we're different biologically. But why does it then follow that we have to be different up here? Why does it have to follow that we have to organize society around those differences? I think Louise Perry and Mary Harrington's are one of the biggest, then, their conversations around feminism and sexual freedom are one of the biggest threats to women's freedom at the moment. Because they are doing what old conservative farts used to do, which is essentializing women, tying us to our biology, making us slaves to the fact that we can get pregnant, that we have periods, and that, oh, by the way, our emotions are tied to all of that. Fuck off. I mean, seriously, we, we had those arguments, and I thought we won them. So why have we given up on them? Why have we decided that? You know, that the tools with which we have created as human beings to liberate us, they're just tools, contraceptive pill, abortion procedures. They don't have magical powers. They're just tools that we can decide what to do with. And that doesn't, using them doesn't make anything happen other than end a pregnancy or prevent a pregnancy. But they are tools through which we as human beings make stuff happen. Okay, audience, some thoughts, Ella, on what you've been saying. I, I think I find some of your points are maybe a bit contradictory. Um, so you talked about um, vulnerability being inherent to sex. Um, but if we think about a lot of the messaging from the 90s, like that us millennials grew up with, it was about sex being empowering. Um, and there can be value to that, but I think it actually stripped away the notion that there is vulnerability and intimacy. So um, a lot of people came to sort of objectify each other. Um, if I think back to being at uni, um, not, you know, you could, people were having fun, but, if, but really they were also being quite thoughtless at times in, in how they engaged in sex. And you talk about, you know, young people shouldn't be afraid of bad sex, but, um, having talked to a lot of friends, I've seen that actually it was damaging for some of that messaging to, to, um, to result in a lot of bad sex uh, and people carry with them that baggage. So if we can actually impart messages on young people that can help them navigate this while avoiding a lot of bad sex, um, that would actually be good. And actually the, the vulnerability point is important because like you say, romance and intimacy do depend on that vulnerability. So if we actually bring that back into the conversation rather than just making it about the sexes being completely equal and empowerment being uh, you know, the only goal, actually then people, young people might start to have sex but in a more conscientious way being open to the possibility of something more developing because I do feel in the 90s, you know, thinking back, I definitely embrace the idea that, well, if, it, you know, if sex is just sex, there's no, doesn't have to have intimacy and it doesn't have to have any, any meaning, uh, then I can just shut away the idea that, you know, it has to develop into anything. And in a way that was also restrictive and rigid. Um, so just some thoughts. Um, my question really is, would you say that the opinions of Louise Perry and Mary Harrington are a luxury belief? Because the way I see it is they seem to be, it's a, a bit of a class issue as well, but they seem to be quite middle class women who've had their own experiences and then they've retrospectively looked back, decided that it's better for society for girls working class girls to keep their knickers on and not have the pleasures and the fun that actually is available to them and completely understandably available to them. Um, I mean, personally, I grew up, came of age in the 90s. I'm a Gen Xer. I was born in the 70s. I had lots of sexual freedom, enjoyed it, had bad sex, 
I didn't realise good sex till I had bad sex. It was fine. It was part of the experience. I have no intention of giving up any of my freedoms, especially sexual ones. It feels like sexual freedom is hard to get without transforming culture of slut-shaming or expecting men to be more traditional providers and other kind of misogynistic and um, misandrist beliefs. And it does feel like with the popularity of social media and you know the capability to just share things about other people, whereas in the 90s, if, if I slept around, maybe a new partner doesn't necessarily know that or have the capability to judge me on that, but now it's almost weaponized. And so our... Um, I don't know if this is a popular thing, maybe this is just on the internet, but it feels like our regressiveness into more traditional conservative beliefs is actually what's causing us to retrieve from or go back from the sexual freedom that we've been given. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. It's similar to what I was um, going to make about um, younger generation. Maybe there's a fear of being kind of shamed online. And um, I wonder if we're at the beginning of a potentially kind of new sexual revolution with apps available like Field, where you can give details of your sexual preferences and what you want and this greater communication in sex. Um, and then you also have dating apps like Hinge where people can give more details on the types of relationship that they're looking for on those apps. And I wonder whether we're, we're reaching a point where there's more communication, um, which is a good thing ultimately in sex. Catherine Angel has written quite a good book, um, which is a play on Foucault, and I can't remember the title, Tomorrow's Sex Will Be Good Again. And she does make the point that sexual desire um, is, is complicated. And she has this nice line, which is, it's not a menu. And ultimately, we've all met people who tick all the boxes, but don't get your um, heart racing. And I think sometimes the desire to kind of control sex actually um, ends up opening up to both scrutiny of others, but also a kind of a checklist, which actually won't work. But that's my own opinion. Sorry, intervention from the chair. Um, there's, a man, there's a man there. Hi, thank you. Uh, I, I wonder if we... <laughs> <laughs> Bring <Sorry>. him to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if we might gain some insight into the issue by perhaps turning the question or the, the theme on its head. Uh, have we given up on sexual freedom? It seems to me that it's, have we ever tried sexual freedom? Because yeah. the kind of revolution that seems to have taken place in the 60s was never about freedom, it was about license. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. perhaps directing the question most of you, um, Rolf, because you know, the, the idea, you mentioned Adorno and you, you, your, your, the title of your pamphlet is Un Unshackled Intimacy, and I'm reminded of uh, Adorno's line and Towards a New Freedom, where he talks, the manifesto Towards a New Freedom, where he talks about the dream on, of an unshackled reality. Um, and as I understand freedom, freedom is essentially concerned not with doing what you want, when you want, for how long you want. Freedom is ultimately about a process of discovering the good and then trying to structure one's life in accordance with that good. And if we understand freedom in that way, it allows us to, I think, grapple with some of these difficulties and ambiguities that have been mentioned. Uh, maybe we, we should conceive of good sex and bad sex is not purely in terms of is it pleasurable sex, but is it, is it sex for the right reasons? Is it, is, is it something that we, in, in our reflective capacities, would approve of? And in that way, you might tr try, I don't know, escape what strikes me as the kind of tindification of the sexual experience by situating and con or conceptualizing freedom not as license, but as the pursuit of the good. I, want, I do want the panel to say a few things. So after you two, I want very brief comments and then come out again. I can't help feel that sexual freedom is just a complete fantasy. In a lot of senses, I want as much freedom as I can have from the state and the government, because we all know the fucking goes one way in that relationship. But when it comes to relationships that we have, <laughs> relationships that we have with each other, we're not free. We're always internally obligated. I am not free to do what I want because I know it will hurt my wife. I know it will hurt my son irrevocably, and who knows? I know it will hurt my family. 
So is this just a myth that we're trying to get hold of? Um, hello. Um, so I'm going to speak as a boring young person. Um, I've only ever been with one person, um, three years in April. Um, and my experience of it and growing up in this kind of modern day is I didn't want to exploit the other person. You know, in anything that resembled a sexual encounter, I kind of felt bad for the other person. Like I was kind of consuming a product and I didn't want to be responsible for that in a way. Um, and growing up, that was something that, you know, I, I did struggle with a lot. Um, I remember being 15 years old, being offered it, if you will, um, and declining purely for the reason of, well, I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't want to, you know, consume this experience and leave you and never speak to you again. Um, because I don't think you can separate the sexual experience and, you know, intimacy emotionally. Um, and I, I just think that's my experience with it, in that, you know, you just, you just can't separate the two. And I, I do think it is something to consider. Um, you know, I do think people should have the freedom to do that, but it is something to, you know, bear in mind that, you know, there are emotions. It's not just a thing to take, in my opinion. Okay, um, a couple of comments from the panel. Nina? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, let's be clear, I mean, you always have sex with somebody, you know, I mean, sex is, even when with it's just yourself, you're still having sex with somebody, it's, you know, and it's a break with narcissism, and I think, you know, the point about relationality and duty and all of the things that it implies are serious, you know, even if we're saying, oh, I just want to have sex with fun, and you agree we're having fun, and we're just going to do that, you know, that's still a relation, and I think, you know, the problem with the narcissistic consumerist culture is that people are encouraged to forget about the fact that we are in relation, um, you know, and it, especially in these kind of very intimate um, situations. So I respect, you know, you at the back for saying that and uh, for, for thinking about the other person's emotion and your duty and respect t to them, even as a horny teenager, you know, that's quite serious. <laughs> you know, what a good thing to do and, and thinking about the harm that it, it would do. So I think, you know, and just to defend my friends, Mary Harrington and Louise Perry, very briefly to say, you know, what, what one of the things they're saying is basically, look, the sexual, the, you know, the tyranny of sexual expectation is not the only possible route. You know, you don't have to go down the kind of app thing. That, that equally can become a form of pressure and a form of unfreedom, actually, if you think, oh, the only way I can get recognition is to be sexual and to offer anal on the first date. You know, that's, that's tyranny, you know what I mean? Like, to be able to refuse that and to say, no, I want a, a meaningful relationship. I want to get married. I only want to have sex with one person. You know, that's about broadening the culture and a kind of pluralism, um, you know, not a kind of telling people what to do in the, in the, the way I think it's being portrayed, maybe. Ralph. You, you can say what you, say what you want, but you have written quite eloquently about objectification. <laughs> um, I commend it to you if he doesn't comment upon it now. Um, on the question of the good and sexual freedom, um, I think we are also we have to talk about social or how we get socialized into sexuality because before, at least in the past, it was through your family and the church that these were the institutions that socialized people into sexual ethics. What was what was the right model of sexuality to do, which was, you know, traditionally heterosexual marriage life you know and the purpose was to produce children and to raise the next generation to you know enliven the community but that those institutions have for various reasons been very much weakened so then that's where it comes to the university point that now you have like either the state directly or sort of universities or other kinds of institutions sort of directly telling people what the right sexual ethics are in, you know, through consent, the sort of consent model and other ways. But the, you know, the, the real truth is, is that there is no sort of ethical concrete, just like with morality, just ordinary morality, that in a sense we human beings have to use our own sort of minds and sort of think through the ambiguities of sexual ethics and there are many ambiguities and there's no kind of you know tablet for Moses that's gonna make it comfortable and sort of tie it in, into a nice bow for us so that's where Rosie yeah um, I wanted to respond to the gentleman at the front um, about sexual freedom being a fantasy and I, I, I think I kind of 
agree. And I'm surprised that we haven't really talked about the real problem that faces so many of us um, once we get into longer term relationships, we move from a state of lust and romantic love and all the wonderful stuff that you're talking about, romance, into an attached stage where we're really just chatting about who puts the bins out and who wipes the dog sick up and, you know, all that really humdrum, boring stuff. And sex goes out of the window. And often, if we do think about sex, we're not thinking about sex with that person we're supposed to have sex with. Um, so we are worried about hurting people if we think about sex, but isn't that to do with the structures we've put around sex? And when I did look into opening up my relationship, which is also fraught with problems, and went to the lesbian sauna um, for research. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> we actually ended up, um, not nobody had wild sex, we just ended up folding towels and tidying up after the more hedonistic <laughs> gay men. <laughs> but you see, there we are. Um, <laughs> but still, actually being around the possibility of sex was quite sexy in a way. So I, I do think that, that, yeah, the freedom is, is probably a fantasy. Hello. Um, I mean, look, let's look at hang up on Harrington and Parry, but I think that it's disingenuous, um, Nina, to try and paint them as just people who are saying there's, a, oh, there's another option than anal, um, because I think it's, it, it's more serious than that. I mean, I think I'm right in saying that Parry runs, you know, kind of dating groups that, you know, where the rule is you don't sleep on the first date. Which is f fine. I have no opposition to uh, church groups running, you know, matchmaking, you know, ceremonies where people, you know, come with a set. There's a set of rules, and you kind of all agree when you go in the door. This is how we're going to run things. Or private members club where you do the total opposite. No, there's, there's no problem to that. But the, you know, the, what what I do take issue with is the idea that politically, because that's a political argument, not just a sexual preference argument, that politically there is something wrong with a woman who thinks it's good to sleep on the first day. That's that's the issue that uh, that I have a problem with. Um, and just in relation to the kind of some, you know, you at the back, are very brave in saying that. Thank you. I think I, I've I think it's tragic that you felt choked by fear around your sexual interactions and I'm sure that you know you I'm glad that you've you seem like you know what you want and everything but I think there is a real problem with the way in which we have fetishized and over politicized sex into this you know I've talked about it as being this huge highfalutin thing of human interaction and all the rest of it I don't think we're doing that when we sort of overcomplicate sex in that good way. What we're doing is actually say, you know, the ramifications of what you're about to do are so immense that just don't do it. And that's what a lot of young people are doing. They're, you know, either sexting, there was a BPAS, the British, Pre British Pregnancy Advisory Service did a great su survey around this. Um, you know, people are more, young people are more likely to sext than they are to have sex. And obviously, the, you know, the difference is, as Nina says, that there's, there's only one person really involved in your sexting act, in your interaction. You might be talking to someone, but you and your sexual arousal are alone. You know, when you watch pornography, it's obviously not a sex, it might be a sexual act, but it's just a form of sort of masturbation. It's not sex, it's not with anyone else, it's very isolated. So whoever said we should start having sex, actually have sex, yes. is right. Because that, and unless you do that, then you don't get to understand the possibilities of sex because you're not interacting with anyone else. And just one final thing, Tiff, sorry, is that field. I've never, ever, I know one who I know who's on field is, and no offence to you if you are, um, is at all interesting about sex. They are all so boring about <laughs> sex. My friend who uh, talked to me at length about being on field and having this menu of uh, her sexual interests went on a, uh, on a walk with a couple around a park to discuss what kind of sexual interests they had to see if they were compatible before they're like, oh my God, you know, like, what weirdos are you? So weird and boring. And, but on a serious note, I mean, you know, talk about taking the sting out of it. When, you know, when my, me and my husband first had our first kiss, we spent about an hour watching Green Wing on Channel 4 with our hands edging closer and closer <laughs> together to see, you know, to, it was that moment of, I don't know, I don't know, does he actually like me? Does she actually like me? What's going to happen? And I think if we take out that sort of, terrifying aspect of sex, then we lose all the incredibleness of it.
Thank you. Could we've got 10 minutes left, so we're going to have to be quick. Can I see the last show of hands, please? I don't know if anyone here has read uh, The Right to Sex by Amir Srinivasan. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a really good book. I recommend it. Really much needed philosophical analysis, I think, of kind of modern sexual culture. And one of the many things that she argues in it, which I think is interesting, is that that sexual freedom that we've been talking about is experienced differently by different people in different circumstances, which I think is relatively straightforward, at least. One of the ways you can cut it, there are many ways you can cut it, but she talks a lot about class. And I thought that might be quite interesting to ask the panel. I grew up in a very working class environment. I've got a lot of friends from that background. I've got a lot of friends from uni who are middle or upper middle class. And the way in which they, especially my close female friends, experience sexual freedom varies very, very differently depending on what class background they come from. Part of that is due to the sort of conversations they grew up with about sexuality and sex. Part of it is due to the prevailing cultures around sex in those environments. I think part of it as well is just also, in very simple terms, it seems the financial and social freedom to be able to go out and meet people and do things as opposed to be stuck you know, in a nine to five or a two jobs, three jobs, zero hour wage jobs, those sorts of things. So I wonder to what extent does that impact on sexual freedom and can we necessarily say that it's experienced the same way for different people in those different circumstances? Um, I'm thinking, uh, uh, hearing uh, the panel was talking about a, a feel it's all like very uh, like a, a sad future, seeing there's no freedom for <laughs> like for people who are married, uh, thinking, yeah, wow, uh, if you still have <laughs> desire, if you still have desire of uh, uh, having freedom of sex, uh, sexual freedom, it seems like uh, you know, it's, it's like hurt, hurt the other partner or your, your husband or wife. But um, I think people still have that desire. Then how, our, our title today is, uh, can we still have sexual freedom? The answer is no, but I think the answer is yes, uh, because uh, uh, you know, uh, I think human nature. You know, because uh, marriage is uh, is is it's designed later after it's uh, human designed. In natural uh, world doesn't have this. And I remember I read something years ago. They say one president or one one woman was uh, having the debate, uh, what the election for president, and she said, uh, "If I got elected and." I'm going to set up a rule saying marriage after seven years will automatically uh, expire. And if you want to continue to... Uh, anyway, I mean, that's a thought. <laughs> that means, you know, people are thinking, you know, because uh, marriage is like... Uh, in China, people say marriage is the tomb of uh, love. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bondage. Uh, like, you know, it, if you want to have other ideas and then... But I think the solution is... Uh, I heard the, the word called open marriage. If, if your partner kind of agree on the certain terms, that, that's, that is solution. If you both want to explore and then think, oh, uh, if you, if, like they, they say, if you feed, that there are two dogs. If you feed this dog, okay, and then, okay. so I'm going to have to. Uh, no, no, that's not, not, not a good metaphor. Anyway, so if you, <laughs> yeah. She, so it, you can physically have uh, like a freedom, but uh, psychologically you still have your love in your home, family. That's, that's the uh, uh, bottom line. I think that way you can kind of free, yeah. You can have report the back in a few years' time. <laughs> um, <laughs> if maybe from the 90s onwards, if maybe the, the confusion or the problem started being when we kind of started equating sexual freedom with quantity or kind of at least uh, applauding it or, or kind of making it seem that quantity seemed to be more what we were discussing than, you know, quality or, or choice, which I'm all for that. And when, when you put it in those terms, like it's irrefutable that it's a good thing. I just feel a little bit, the problem seems to be, and I don't know what that means for now, Gen Z, I'm not one of them, like, in terms of it went so far that there's nothing going on now, but it just seems that what are the terms and what is the weight that we're really looking here? Because if, kind of almost mathematically, if, you, if, if it is quantity and if you have something that is out there like that, obviously it becomes harder to see the value in it, and that's obviously a little bit of the fear. So is sexuality, if 
if it becomes everywhere all the time, obviously it starts losing value. And I, I just don't believe that probably that's also sexuality should necessarily be uh, the same as uh, having closeness or you know anything of that nature. So that for me, quantity quality is a little bit the, the question here as well. Okay, Something sir. I find quite striking is that the F word is much, people are much more comfortable using the F word and also in publication than the L, the four letter L word, uh, which is very interesting, I find, because, and that wasn't the case before. Uh, and something which, which is, uh, seems to have happened in our society is we treat sex as trans transactional uh, rather than focusing on intimacy. And so when, you're, when, when something is transactional, you are being used, and people don't like being used. So perhaps that is part of the reason for the decline of this sexual freedom, because actually, if it's freedom around being used, it's not uh, very fun. Uh, what we were talking about before with the menu of the dating app, um, I suppose the lesbian equivalent of Sexton, when I first met, or when I first spoke to my partner on Tinder, um, we were discussing uh, our preference with coffee, and she said that she liked Nespresso pods, and I didn't speak to her for eight months. Um, right. <laughs> and I think that sort of summarizes the entire problem with the overthinking youth of today and the um, preventiveness of actually, you know, finding the one. And, you know, we're getting married next year. So. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask the panel to sum up a very quick point. Uh, what do they think the future of sexual freedom should be? Uh, in the order they spoke, uh, Nina. Gosh, uh, I sort of want to say that sex is boring. Uh, I've said it now. Um, I think midsummer murders is a good solution to the crisis. <laughs> of the um, <laughs> no, I, in all seriousness, I, I, I think that people are still quite gentle and intimate and don't want to be used and they don't want to be brutalised. And actually, sex is traumatic. And I do agree with Ella that, that sex is a risk and sex has consequences and sex is a very profound thing. And I, you know, trauma often comes when we can't fantasise, actually. You know, what traumatic sex is is the inability to have a fancy, a narrative that accompanies sex. And you don't necessarily know in advance whether that's going to happen, and I agree. And so I think that pe people thinking carefully about having sex with someone is not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it means that we're not being narcissistic. I think it means that we're being other-directed and compassionate and thoughtful and, and so on. And I don't think we should be brutalising ourselves for the sake of quantity or consumption or experience. I think we can actually have a much more beautiful and gentle life doing beautiful and gentle things, and those are meaningful you know, a hug can be really meaningful, or a conversation, or a coffee, preferably good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> Not traumatic, or trauma coffee. Yeah. Um, just wanted to say something on objectification so that it doesn't seem I was dodging the point. Um, objectification is inherent to sexuality. Um, even but what, what, what it depends on is the type of objectification in the context. So an intimate couple can objectify each other while they're having sex without using or denigrating or exploiting or brutalizing that person. While in other contexts, of course, it can have those contexts. So just one point there. Um, second point... Uh, second point, um, if there is a novel I would recommend on this, it would be uh, this by um, Salwa al Naimi called The Proof of the Honey. And she has, there's a little passage within it where she talks about how some, uh, some people think about spirit while I think about bodies. And it's my body with his body. And if there is something we could improve, uh, you know, talk about is to, you know, improve the, how we think about the human body, that the human body is not this, like, disgusting little excretion from nature that is inhabited with a soul from God, but it's rather part of our own, you know, humanity. You know, it's, we are our bodies. It's, you know, we don't exist outside of it. We are, we constitute ourselves within our own bodies. So, 
Yeah, there. Crazy. Um, thank you. I, I think the future of sexual freedom is constant communication, negotiation, compassion, and putting yourself in the place of, of other people around you, whether they do come from a different class, a different identity, um, wh whoever they are. Um, I think we don't necessarily hear one another. And as I say, I, I believe we look at sex through this myopic lens and we look at it through a very western lens as well i mean if we start to look around the world there are 18 amazonian tribes that believe in the concept of partable paternity that the woman should have sex with lots of different men and they're all the father of the child so uh, you know i just think there are different ways of looking at this and i think maybe some more fluid contracts might might be interesting you know to look at but i think we struggle to separate love and sex i don't think it's it's easy however you do it um but there was a study done where a quarter of young people said that they would prefer marriage contracts to work like a mobile phone contract which would uh, you could renew every couple of years so there's the illusion of freedom isn't there and maybe it would work because when i think about it that is the longest lasting relationship i've ever had <laughs> ella um <coughs> I just want to return to this idea that it's the it's the freedom word that's most important, um, and that's you know talked about quality and quantity. Um, I don't think that they're really. I don't think we should be too uh, constricted in the way in which or or fret too much about um, what kind of sex and how much we're having of it. Um, I think we should sort of take the sting out of it and just say that freedom, sexual freedom means being open to the possibility of it and being open to the possibility of interactions with one another. And, you know, you, cha <laughs> you, you might change your mind. I used to um, really love that line from that Joni Mitchell song. We don't need no piece of paper from the city hall keeping us tied and true. And, yeah, I got fucking married. So, I mean, you know, that gave up on that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, that was what I wanted to do. And I think, you know, Ralph has, has mentioned a novel. I think that everyone who is trying to roll back our sexual freedom because they think that unrestricted uh, human agency will lead to ruin should be forced to read Jane Eyre. Because <laughs> what happens in... There's not a lot of sex in Jane Eyre. But <laughs> what happens in that love story, the, I think the greatest love story ever written, is that Jane goes and finds out something about herself, that she has the freedom and the space to, away from Rochester, even though she returns to him, and actually, in fact, because she returns to him, is because she finds out something about herself through the possibility, through being open, through, you know, through having freedom, to a certain extent, in Charlotte Bronte's imagination. And I think that is so powerful, you know, that we can, con we can conform and constrict ourselves and restrict ourselves in something like marriage or a relationship. But if we know that's what we want, because we have, had, we have the possibility of freedom and we have choice, we have that option, then you can decide to be as totally conservative as you like. And if my husband ever talks about open relationship, I'll fucking kill him. <laughs> so, you know, but, but, but taking away that choice because we think that human beings are predilected towards animalistic, biological, deterministic, bad behavior is, I think, misunderstanding who we are and misunderstanding what we could be. Thank you to our panel. find that a rather hopeful end. <laughs>